Christmas is about the impossible. You realize you have a big God that can do anything. And you're not here by accident. You're not watching online by accident. God can do anything. You guys look so good. I'm glad you guys are at church. Um, If you want to take a picture, there's a place up in the front to take a picture. You take a picture with your family. Please do that. Um, And and would you just again show appreciation to our choir that we put together? That was Faith Chadden. She didn't get, you know, a lot of them, we have five Christmas Eve services. This is number one. And uh, they're going to be here, many of them, all five Christmas Eve services. So we appreciate them doing that. Uh, let's jump into this. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Here's the story. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was what church was? Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of situation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, say behold with me, behold, such a a great Christmas word. Um, You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him, what? Jesus. Powerful, glorified name. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, Even your relative, Elizabeth, has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren (laughs) is now in her sixth month. Isn't that a cool light? In verse 37, let's read it together. This is a verse we're going to be honing in on today and, and this weekend. For nothing will be impossible with God. Uh, God, would you just move in hearts. Thank you for the souls that you brought to church. Thank you for the souls that are watching online. And I pray that every soul hears a word from you, God. Would you give them a new perspective just because they met with you, Lord? I know your presence changes everything. It did for Mary. And I pray that your presence overshadows every man and every woman, young and old. Take a hold of me by your grace and use me for your glory. You direct the words that come out of my mouth and my thoughts, Lord. We need to hear a word from you, Lord, not from anyone else. So this Christmas, would you meet with us, God? Thank you, God, for the greatest gift of all, your only son. Thank you. I pray that all of us unwrap your only son. I pray that all of us turn to you, Lord. I pray that hearts are ripe. I pray that hearts are soft to receive your word. I pray your word grows roots. I pray you speak to the person who's been in church all their life, the person who's been maybe a Christian a long time and who's seen all kinds of services and heard all kinds of sermons and preachers. Would you move in that person in a fresh way? And I pray for the person maybe who was dragged to church or the person who hasn't been in church in a long time or ever. Would you move in their heart, show them your love and your grace, God. Anoint me, anoint this message. According to Isaiah 61, may your spirit, O Lord, fall upon me. You know I've been working on this, Lord, but it means nothing without you. You're the one who makes the fire go. So make the fire go. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for praying with me. I'm so glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Christmas Eve is one of my favorite, favorite uh, times of the year. It it really is. Um, Hey, we had a little bit of a cold front. Are you guys aware of that? We had a little cold front. You may have heard about it just a little bit. Um, We had some people from Arizona visiting. This is how it all, you know, it's like, you know, you went from one extreme to the other. Last night, uh, or yesterday, I was driving home and I took a picture with my my cell phone. 
while I was parked in the middle of Colorado Street. And uh, <laughs> no, I took a picture, and uh, I had to take it because if you see this picture, do you see the front coming in? Isn't that amazing? Uh, I was in like clear weather driving, and I saw the front coming in, and I thought, this is amazing. It looked like smoke, but it was just the cold temperature coming in, like just moving through. And if you see it, you've noticed it comes all the way, it came all the way across the United States. My sister lives in Dayton, Ohio, and it hit them today, and it, I don't need a windshield factor below 27. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And I thought about this, and, and, and do you ever think like, gosh, you know what? I'm not that big, and God is a big God. I mean, a, a, an entire front, a, 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 you know, all of North America is impacted by this thing and how God just does whatever he does, and he uses it all for his glory. And then, you know what else I thought? I thought, this is the way the Spirit of God moves. The Spirit of God moves and it takes over. That's exactly what happened with Mary. Let's talk about this conversation between the angel Gabriel and, and Mary. Uh, famous conversation. I, I mean, if there was one conversation that perhaps is one of the most significant in Scripture, this is it. Um, for 400 years or so, 400 years... It's been silent. God hasn't been speaking to anyone ever since the prophet Malachi. And then when you jump to the New Testament, all of a sudden God starts speaking through the angel Gabriel and, of course, through John the Baptist. But for 400 years, it's been silent. And there's this one incredible, significant conversation between Mary and Gabriel. Sometimes we underestimate conversations. If you had conversations with people and you're like, I don't realize the weight of this conversation, but it's really significant. So you, she has this conversation with Gabriel and she's talking. And incidentally, when you look at scripture, Mary and Joseph, they're engaged and they're righteous before the eyes of God. Same thing with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're righteous before the eyes of God. And she meets Gabriel and she's having this conversation just back and forth. And it's an amazing conversation. And verse 37 says this, for nothing will be impossible with God. Do you believe that? You know, I, I, uh, if you looked at my, my Bible, um, I'm a little bit emotionally attached to this verse. So I'm just telling you that right now. I feel like I'm just being honest with you. And if you look at Luke chapter 1, verse 37 in my Bible, um, I have this date marked, and it's July 13, 2012. When this was happening, Thorn Creek Church, you know, we started in a living room with three strangers. Glory to God. You're walking into a God thing. And this has been a journey, guys. It's been a journey. And it's been, you know, we've been highs and lows, and you love people, and, and, and you're hurt, and everything in between. And, and, but July 13, 2012, um, I just got back from a sabbatical. I spent about six or seven weeks away because I was just tired. I was worn out as a pastor. And, and you've ever been tired, worn out, and all that stuff? That's where I was at spiritually. And I came back, and on July 13, 2012, the place, the building that we were meeting in, we were told by new buyers that we had to leave the building. We were being evicted. We didn't know where we were going to go. We didn't know how we were going to get there. We didn't know where we were going to be doing church in a week or two weeks or a month. We didn't know who would be staying with us and who would be leaving and all that stuff because you just know how people are, right? Um, everybody's okay with change until it affects you. Everybody's fine with it. But you, it's just so many unknowns. And I was sitting in my office and the Lord showed me this verse. Nothing will be impossible with God. It's amazing how one word from the Lord just changes your perspective. Have you ever had that one moment with God where God gives you one word and that juices you up? It's like, boom, <laughs> it's like, I'm not worried about anything. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God's with me. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I know God's with me. I don't know what's going to happen in a month. I don't know what this means. I don't know. All I know is God's with me and that's enough. Anybody with me? That's all I want to know is God's with me. So the, God gave me that verse in July 13, 2012. And maybe you're in an impossible situation or maybe you've been there before. Maybe you're facing an impossible situation right now. Maybe, maybe getting out of debt is an impossible situation for you. And you're thinking, I don't know how we'll ever get out of it. Or maybe your marriage isn't where it used to be and you're married and you're like, it just feels impossible right now. I don't know about this. Or maybe, maybe you're grieving over something and you're like, I don't know if I'll ever be truly over it. I don't know if I can be healed. Or maybe trusting someone is an impossible situation for you. Maybe, maybe you've just been hurt and you just live in and you're thinking, I don't know if I can. Or maybe, maybe you've been through a painful breakup 
And moving forward is just a challenge. It's just a ch- Or maybe you're living with anxiety. And you're thinking, I'd love to be over this, but it feels like it's impossible. Or maybe you're addicted to something. And you're like, nobody knows about this addiction, but me and God. And this thing just has my number, and I don't know if I'll ever be set free from this addiction. Or maybe you used to be really close to God. Maybe you used to attend church all the time. Maybe you used to serve, and you were in it. You were in the fight all the time. You were right there. And you just haven't. You just have drifted away from that life for whatever reason. And you're thinking, you know what? It's just impossible. I don't think I'll ever go back to where that was. And for whatever reason, whatever it is, I want you to know you're in the right place. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them you're in the right place. Can you do that? God loves you. God loves you. God cares about you. There are some things that this angel Gabriel says to Mary. And, and one of the first things the angel Gabriel says is this greetings favored one. And then there's this phrase, the Lord is with you. And I just feel like somebody needs to hear this. The Lord hears your prayers. God knows what you're going through. God knows your thoughts right now. God sees you. He knows you intimately. He knows what you've been through in life. He knows the joys and the pains. He knows your worries. He knows what will happen tomorrow. And the Lord is with you. God sees you. God shows up and talks to Mary and tells her, the Lord is with you. That's how he starts off this conversation the Lord is with you. And she's perplexed. 400 years, it's been silent. And she, have, you ever, have you ever been in a presence where, where it's kind of like, you know what, I had no idea God was here. You're just like, I didn't know God was here. And I'm going through life and I'm so busy. And I've got things in my mind. And I've got things to do every day. And I, I wake up and I brush my teeth. And I you know, go through my routine. And I got to work. And I got to go to school or whatever it is. And you're just back in the grind. And you're back. And the Lord is with you. Glory to God. It's an incredible word. Just take a hold of that. Take a hold of that. And the next thing the angel says to her is this, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Isn't that cool? That's one of the first things. It's been said, do not be afraid, is listed 365 times in the Bible. Why is do not be afraid spoken of so often in the Bible? Why is that? We are all driven by fears, all of us. Fear of being alone and fear of failure. You know, some of you work so hard because you have a fear of failure. Fear of not being liked or, or, or fear of not being accepted. Fear of death. Wow, that's big now, isn't it, guys? Fear of death. It changes a little bit when you're 10 feet away from the door of death. I'm just telling you that. (laughs) Fear of abandonment. Fear of of losing what you have. Fear of being betrayed. Fears. And you got to be careful because the devil capitalizes on fear. There's people that don't turn to God because of fear. There's people who don't get involved in church because of fear. Fear. And there's people who don't get in relationships and don't trust others because of fear. You can actually, the devil can actually use fear to keep you away from a good thing. To keep you away. And I love the fact in Isaiah, one of the names of Jesus is this. This is, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Let's say it together, guys. Wonderful Counselor. Keep going. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, there it is, Prince of Peace. Glory to God. Prince of Peace. Anybody need peace today? I'll take peace over sitting on a beach in Kauai. I'm just telling you. Anybody with me? I'll take peace over over Barbados. I'll take peace over anything. Peace is incredibly valuable. And one of the titles of Jesus is Prince of Peace. Some of you are having a hard time sleeping at night because you don't have peace. Some of you are worried about things because you don't have peace. And the next thing this angel says to Mary, it says, and here it comes, verse 31, here comes the impossible. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Now, Mary's engaged 
you ever been around a woman who's getting ready to be married? There's like, they're glowing. They're so excited. And they always look beautiful. Oh, and they still do. Let me make sure I say that right. They still look beautiful. But there's something about the wedding day. I'll just tell you, when I marry people and I look at the guy, I always look at his face because he's looking at his bride come down with a long dress. And I see it all over him. The guy's just glowing as well. He's like, man, I scored big time. You can just see that excitement he has his face. And there's this excitement that he has. And then the angel Gabriel tells Mary... You're gonna have a you're gonna have a kid. In fact, you're you're pregnant. Okay, now someone once said, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. If you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. Now we have plans and we make plans. And if, if you're a little bit like me and you know us, you think, okay, by the age of, by the time I graduate high school, I want to accomplish this. By the time I'm 21, I wanna, by the time I'm 25, by the time I'm 30, by the time I'm 40, I want to retire by 50. By the time you make your, how is that coming along? How's that coming along? Some of you who are older and been around longer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The angel Gabriel shows up to Mary and says, okay, I'm just going to interrupt your plans right now. You're actually with child. So now she has a new situation. Now she's got to go to her fiance and say, hey, uh, um, honey, you know that dress that I bought, you know? It's not going to (laughs) fit. That dress that I bought, there's some change of plans. There's something, there's something going on. Uh, One of the problems we have in our thinking, if you think linearly, you'll have a hard time figuring things out in life. Because life is not linear, is it? There's detours. There's turns that you didn't expect to turn. There's roadblocks you didn't expect to have. So life is not linear. It actually, sometimes you go backwards or it feels like you go backwards and things happen that don't make sense. And if you think linearly, you're going to become confused really quickly because life is just turns and twists and spirals and does all the, and you go back 10 steps and you go one and you jump 10 steps and all this kind of thing. And you can feel like you're going backwards. And sometimes it can feel like life is hard. And you think, I didn't expect this to happen. I had my plans. I had my plans. But let me tell you something else. Here's the secret. God will use everything according to his purpose. And I said it before. Let me say it again. You're the project. God loves you. You're the project. God wants you to know his love and his grace. That's his secret. He wants you to know his love and his grace. And you being at church right now, God has put you in this position and you're not here by accident. And God wants you to know you can trust him. You can trust him. See, we live in the balance of improbable and impossible. Improbable is this idea of it's likely won't happen. Probably won't happen. I mean, the Denver Broncos winning the Super Bowl next year, right? I mean, that's like improbable. You're like, I don't don't know about that. That's improbable. But you know what's impossible? The Broncos winning the Super Bowl this year. That's impossible. And the way we think is we live in the improbable. Many things, we try things that we think there is a chance. You know what I'm talking about? But the impossible scares us. The impossible is out of our realms. We trust things we can see. We trust things we can feel. We trust things and we use our own effort and our own strength. And we start trusting ourselves in many ways. But the truth is we're more comfortable with improbable than impossible. In fact, we might even say impossible is foolish, right? You're crazy. Impossible. You're crazy. I remember when I first came to know Jesus and and I was so excited and my old basketball coach in high school, I, uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to tell him, actually not high school, it was like seventh grade or something like that. I wanted, to, I wanted to tell him that I knew Jesus, but I had no idea where he was at. And I remember I started praying and I was living in San Antonio, big city. And I started praying that I would run across, run across Coach Paul Joseph. And I, I started praying, God, I want to run across Paul Joseph. I don't know where he's at. I just want to, I want to tell him what Jesus, I want to tell him what you did in my life. And I didn't see him anywhere. And, and then lo and behold, 
lo and behold, like two weeks after that prayer, I'm sitting at a pizza hut in downtown Denver, and he walks in the door. See, some of you, you think, right now, I just lost a lot of you, I know. Some of you are saying coincidence. And I want you to know we have a God of miracles and your prayers are powerful and God hears your prayers. And God pays attention even to your little prayers. Hear this, God does not differentiate between improbable and impossible. There's no improbable and impossible. You know why? Because he's God. He can do anything. He doesn't need any other person or anything to do what he wants to do. I mean, God spoke and it came into existence. One of the problems we have today is we can read these amazing stories in the Bible and we think, well, that was then. And today's different. And we look at our circumstances and we think, why would God care? Why would God use? Why would God? And, and you convince yourself out of a miracle. When you look at, uh, I, I think about the early days when we were starting Thorn Creek Church, and I remember we were about two years old, and I had someone look for land for us, and they looked, and I remember them looking at I-25 and looking at Washington, and they told me, Pastor Reuben, the land between I-25 and Washington is known as the Washington Corridor. It is prime land. The church will never own property between Washington and I-25. That's what he told me. And then I thought, you know, game on. <laughs> game on. And lo and behold, we're sitting on 15 acres between Washington and I-25 right now. You know, nothing is impossible for God. Whatever you're going through, nothing is impossible. Mary says this, and I love this question. She says, how can this be? Since what? Since I'm a virgin. Since I'm a virgin, say virgin with me. Just say it out loud, just virgin. We don't say it enough in church. I'm a virgin. <laughs> but, but check this out. Mary's thinking logically. You got to have sex first, and then the baby comes. And it's almost like she's telling God, God, I don't know if you understand how this stuff works down here. I don't know. And we can, we can, all, we can all be guilty of that kind of thinking. Like, God, I don't, under, I don't know if you know how this works. I'm in a, I'm in a financial situation and I don't have a job, and you're telling me you're going to be with me? I don't know. You know what, God? You got it backwards. Show me the money. God says, I want you to trust me. And you're like, okay, I'll trust you when I see this. But God is God, and he can do anything he wants. He can do anything he wants. And, and Mary says, look, I'm a virgin, and I don't understand this, and it's a good lesson for us. God is not confined to your understanding. Regardless of how smart you are, your IQ, your SAT scores, God is not confined to your understanding. Aren't you glad God is bigger than your understanding? Aren't you glad you have a God who sees things different? How can this be? And some of you might be asking this question. How can I be happy again? Some of you might be asking that question. Or how can I be full of joy again? Or how can I have peace? Or how can I be free from anxiety? Or how can I trust? Or how can I start over and then you see her go to uh, Joseph. Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. And you know what? He wants out. They're engaged. He knows he hasn't had sex with her. She knows she hasn't had sex with him. And he finds out that she's with child. And there's this crazy story about her and an angel and all this craziness. He wants out. Out. Men, do you understand what I'm talking about? You're in that situation and you're like, you know what? I've heard a lot of things. <laughs> and this one's it. I cannot go forward. Verse 19 says, uh, chapter 1 says, uh, Matthew, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. Say righteous man with me. And did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. That says so much about the person of Joseph. He's not going to post a whole bunch of stuff on Instagram and Facebook and let everyone know. And he's not going to do that. He's concerned about her reputation. He doesn't want to smear her. Righteous people care. Righteous people live for God. Doesn't matter what other people think. And he wants to make sure that he breaks up quietly. As he considered this, you know, he's thinking we got to call the cake people. We got to call the wedding hall people. We got to shut everything. We're just going to, we're going to, the honeymoon's done. Verse 20. As he considered this, he was thinking about it. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, and there it is again, do not be afraid 
to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son. And you are to name him whom, church? Jesus. For he will save his people from their, from their sins. So there it is, isn't it beautiful? God's grace. Like God knows what you need to believe. Some of you, you don't need a whole lot to believe. You're just ready to believe. Others of you, you need a lot. You're just the Thomas. Unless I put my finger in. Unless I touch. Then I'll believe. But others of you will believe just on a word alone. And you'll say, all right, God, I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to put my faith in you. This reminds me of another story. In Genesis chapter 18, you read about these two, this couple, Abraham and Sarah. God gives them this message that they're going to have a child. And you see this over and over. And I want to show you this little conversation because it's, it's really parallel with what we're reading in Luke. It says, then one of them said, I will return to you about this time. This is an angel talking. I'll return to you about this time next year. And your wife, Sarah, will have a son. She's like 90 years old. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such a pleasure? Especially when my master, my husband, who's about 100 years old, is also so old. Anybody over 50 years of age or 60 years of age? Imagine having a kid right now. Get it, go, you got to go buy a playpen and a crib and carrier and do it all over again. Um, Sarah was long past the age of having children. As I thought about this, I, I, I've discovered this. God is attracted to the impossible. I want you to think about this a little bit. God is attracted to the impossible. God shows up when it's impossible. It's when she's old and barren. Now it's time to show up. When she's old and barren, it's when he's old and impotent. Now it's time to show up. It's when, it's when the widow is making her last meal and she's going to die. Then he shows up. It's when, it's when she lost her husband and lost her two sons and she's going back with a couple of Moabite women and that's when he shows up and she wants to change her name to Bitter. Impossible. It's when, it's when you're backed up against the Red Sea and you have an army coming this way and you have the Red Sea on this side and you think it's impossible. That's when he shows up. It's when there's no water anywhere and you're in the wilderness and all that's there is this rock. That's when he shows up. God's attracted to the impossible. It's when you have no strength and you're ready to give up. It's when you're angry. It's when you're worn out. It's when you're the only one. It's when they, God meets you and calls you a mighty hero and you feel like the game is over and you've lost already. It's when you're living in exile. It's when you feel like you've wandered too far and you're off the grid and nobody cares about you and not even you feel like you're so far away from God. That's when he shows up. It's when there's only two fish and five loaves. That's when he shows up. It's that impossible situation when you're in the middle of the storm and the water's coming over the boat and you're gripped with fear and you're thinking, we're going to drown. That's when he shows up. And you look at God closely. He keeps showing up at this, these times when it's impossible. It's the guy sitting by this pool for 38 years wanting to be healed. And it's just about giving up. That's when he shows up. It's like this, it comes from this guy who's demon possessed and everybody else has ostracized this guy and put him out in the, in the outskirts of town and, and he has so many demons, they call him legion. And, and it's, that's when he shows up. It's the woman who had a whole bunch of men, a whole bunch of husbands, and the guy she's living with now is, her, her, is not her husband and, and she's at this well. That's when he shows up. It's when the woman spent all the money on her doctors and the doctors don't know what else to do. But she hears Jesus is in town and she thinks if I could only touch the hem 
of Jesus. That's when he shows up. God's attracted to the impossible over and over and over when you're born with that illness. When he's been dead, good and dead, for four days. That's when he shows up. Have you noticed God shows up when it's impossible? Anybody with me? Anybody ever been there before? You're like, man, I'm just so far. I'm just not. I'm just my situation and my circumstances. It's so desolate. You need to know you have a God who shows up in the impossible. And he's a God who can do anything. He's a God who will meet you and his presence is enough. And he'll work out a miracle. And all you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. Glory to God. That's all you have to do. You have a God who shows up. He loves the impossible. He made a donkey talk. Isn't that crazy? Impossible. He made this big old fish big enough to swallow this guy. Who really, you might think, why in the world did they send that guy? (laughs) He didn't want anyone to turn to God. But God can do anything he wants, and his ways are way more mysterious than your ways. Somebody needs to hear this. It's not too late for God. Sometimes you go through stuff, and you make decisions in your life, and you think, it's too late. I've messed up so much. I've done all this, and now I'm living in the consequences. It's just too late. We're all on this journey together, guys. God has given you breath in your lungs. God wants you to know his son, Jesus Christ. That's what he he wants. And it's never too late for God. You don't give up praying. You know, I I was talking to someone who, who went through a painful divorce. Every divorce is painful. Went through a painful divorce, and as a result of it, hadn't seen his kids for seven years. Seven years. Could you imagine, mom, dad? Seven years. No talking No talking to them for seven years. Nothing. Quiet. And he started praying and praying and praying and praying. And he was at home and he got a phone call from his son after seven years. He was so blown away. He took a screenshot of the phone call just in case he thought he was dreaming or something. He wanted to remember of it. And he told me the story. He actually met with his son. It was a beautiful thing. And they were rebuilding the relationship. And I, I, oh, prayer is so powerful. It's never too late. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them it's never too late. It's never too late. I love what Jeremiah says. Oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You know what's the definition of a miracle? Here it is. A surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. Miracle. That means you can't explain it. It just happened. You can't explain it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mary and Joseph were, were exercising some faith. They didn't understand everything that was happening. It reminds me a little bit of... Uh, our, our, uh, our, one of our pastors, Nick, and Pastor Nick and his, his wife, Rachel, who, who's our children's ministry director, um, a few years ago, they were praying for a child. No children. They were praying for a child, and the child wasn't coming around, and I believe they tried for a couple of years, and just wasn't happening, and they kept praying, and nothing happening, and, and again, God shows up when it's impossible. And they were waiting and waiting, and then something unexpected happened. Um, she had a brain tumor. She had a brain tumor. So she gets this brain tumor, and now they're on this new journey of of what do we do about this brain tumor, and and within literally weeks, you know, she was undergoing surgery, undergoing surgery, and and they're going through this whole emotional experience with, you know, when your loved one is sick, that's hard, and going to the hospital and doing all this kinds of stuff, and, and, and they're going through it, but before they went into it, Rachel said, she got a word from the Lord, and the word was, it's going to be better than you think. That's the word she got from the Lord. So she didn't understand what that meant, but she just knew it's going to be better than you think. And if you've been around for a little bit, you might know this story because she gets out. It's a successful surgery. It's a legit miracle. It's one of the few miracles in Colorado that was done like this. And, and she walks away, and she actually goes home like the same day. of the It's just ridiculous, mind-blowing stuff. And guess what, guys? In a few months after that, she's pregnant. Glory to God. She's pregnant. And the child's about to be one year old. 
next month, Judah. Judah's going to be one year old. Yeah, you know, one of the signs that you're close to God is you can see miracles. You can recognize what it looks like. And I hear that story and I'm so excited. And I think about Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Think about that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I mean, I mean, your faith is your gateway to knowing God. So do you have a lot of faith? Or do you have a little bit of faith? Your faith is the gateway for you to know God. And maybe you think, oh, you know what? I don't have a whole lot. I'm going through some tough stuff. I'm living out of my car. I barely have anything. I'm so far from God. I think I might be an atheist now. I, I just turned my back. It's been such a long, whatever you're at, the little bit of faith that you have is enough for God to work with. It's enough for God to work with. You put your faith in God, and God will show you that if you have him, you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have anything to be afraid of. And I love verse 31. It says, you shall name him Jesus. Let's just say Jesus out loud, really strong. Jesus. One more time. Say Jesus. Jesus. Glorified name. You know what that name means? Here's what the name means. Rescue. Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. Deliverer salvation. In the Old Testament, the name is Joshua. And that's what it means. It's this idea that, you know what, my, his name is Jesus and he's going to rescue, he's going to deliver. That's his job description. That's what he does. Let me show you who Jesus is. I don't know what you thought about Jesus when you came in. Sometimes we get stuck with Jesus as this baby in this manger, which is amazing. <laughs> God sends his only son and chooses for him to enter, not on a horse, not with a great army, but as a, a baby and, and chooses to come into the world with such humble beginnings that he's not born in, in, you know, at the Marriott you know, or the Ritz, but it's in a manger. It's in a manger. What an incredible lesson for us. Not everything is great based on how it looks. Some greatness is, is, is past what it looks like. You know, God always looks at the heart. Look at the heart. Colossians chapter 1, here he is. Christ, that's Jesus, is the visible image of the invisible God. If you see Jesus, you see God. He existed before anything was created before the world was created, before the universe was created, and is supreme over all creation. For through him, say through him with me, through him, God created, what? Created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. There's some things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Jesus and for Jesus. He existed before anything else. And I love this. And he holds all creation together. That's who Jesus is. He's holding all of creation together. Christ is also the head of the church. Hello. Which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. You see Jesus, you see God. The very character of God is the character of Jesus. And through Jesus, through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So there's the mission of Jesus. There's his orders. Just in case we have any military people, there's his orders right there. It's a cross. He's going to make peace with his blood that is shed on the cross. Why would God send his only son into the world? There's a mission. And the mission is there's this chasm between humanity and God, and it's called sin. It happened in Genesis chapter 3. 
the fall of humanity. And that sin entered the world. And it impacted all of us. We were born with sin. And we do things and we think things that we know are not pleasing to God. And it just kind of pollutes our desires. And, and that sin creates this incredible wedge between us and God. And throughout the entire Old Testament, you just see a, a band-aid approach to fix this. But it really isn't fixed until there's one man that goes to the cross. God in the flesh, Jesus, and his blood is shed. And it's enough. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But that's just part of it. That's God's part. Here's your part. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. It's so cool. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 16. Here's Merry Christmas. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So you can celebrate Christmas and not open Jesus. <laughs> you don't know the value of the gift until it's unwrapped. What do you do when you get a present? Most of the time we open it up, don't we? Most of the time. Have you ever had a present that you just don't open up ever? Most of the time we open up our presents. And there's a curiosity of what is this going to look like? I want to encourage you. Some of you need to give your life to Jesus. You haven't done that. You need to give your heart to Jesus. When you discover you have Jesus, you discover you don't need anything else. I love Mary's response. And Mary said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord. Oh, check it out. She says the bond slave of the Lord. This is her response, which is totally different from Zechariah, totally different from Sarah. He, her response is, she says, the bond slave of the Lord. And then she says, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. Do you see her response? She's amazing. But God knew that Joseph and Mary were righteous people. And her response is, I don't understand this whole thing. This, the, how, do you, how do you get pregnant? I haven't had sex. And the angel gave her, says, oh, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to overshadow you. Which is an Old Testament word where the, the cloud overshadowed the tabernacle. Same word here. And, and, and it says, okay, I'm going to overshadow you. And the presence of God is so powerful, if he just overshadows you, bam, you're going to be with child. And sometimes I feel like God explains spiritual things to us, and it's like, okay, thanks for the explanation. I still don't get it. I don't understand. And that's what he says. But she doesn't understand. But her response is, I'm your bond slave, Lord. You know that word bond slave? You see it over and over in scripture. Paul the apostle called himself a bond slave as well. What it means is, I have this rope here, guys. It means to bind yourself with another. That's what it means. I should have asked someone to come up here with me. It means to bind yourself with someone else. Oh, I need someone. Can I get a volunteer? Can someone come up here? Come on up here, Bryce, really quick, brother. I mean, you look so good, too. He looks so good. He's a, he looks sharp. Come on up here, Bryce. I've known Bryce since he's been, I don't know, seven years old or something. Um, and so this is what it is. Here, just stand right here. Face stand, Bryce. And this is, you just, just, just do this here. And just wrap your, wrap your arm, wrap this rope around me. I'll hold it right here. You just wrap it. Keep, keep going around. No, the other way. Don't no, come the, on the bottom. There you go. Yeah, that, there you go. Yeah, there you go. There it is. There it is. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, you got it? You know me? Hold it right here. Okay, let's see. You got it. You see that? Let's go. Here he is. He's with me. Yeah, you got to be ready. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. Um, she said, I don't understand what this means, but I'm going to bind myself to you. I don't get, I don't understand what's happening in my world. I don't understand what's happening in my life. I don't understand. I had my own plans. I was engaged and I'm going to, I had my own plans, but I'm going to bind myself to you. Some of you need to make that decision. You're at this place where you're like, I don't know what's happening. I had my plans and it just looks different. And, and I don't know why that happened to me. And now I'm confused and now I'm hurt. And now I don't understand what's happening. But I'm going to be a bond slave to Jesus. And I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to trust him. And here is, here is kind of this uh, test principle right here. Because Mary and Joseph are at a point where they don't get everything that's happening, the angel visits Mary and Joseph. 
the angel doesn't visit Mary's family and Joseph's family. And I mean, they're kind of in the dark. But Mary and Joseph doing an incredible thing. They say, you know what? We're going to trust God. There was consequences, Old Testament consequences for someone who committed adultery, even stoning. So they're saying, you know what? We don't care what other people think. We're just going to walk with God. We're going to trust God. And you got to understand this testing principle. There's always a time of testing before a time of triumph. Always. There's always a testing when nobody's looking. There's always that, that temptation or that testing, that, that place where that's where you prove yourself to be faithful. That's where you prove yourself to be obedient. That's where you prove yourself to trust God. When nobody is looking, there's always a time of testing before a time of triumph, always. And you see that in Mary and Joseph. And let me say this one thing here. Just take one step. Can you do that? Take one step. Some of you have been through a lot. And I want you to know, you're not here by accident. God sees what's going on and he loves you and he cares about you. Can you take one step? Just one step. One step. Maybe that means, you know, you're going to start praying. Or maybe that means you're going to start reading your Bible. Um, Every day you're going to try to read a chapter or something like that. Or maybe that means, you know what? I need to surround myself with other friends. Or maybe that means I need to trust. Whatever it is, can you take one step. If you're far from God, I want to invite you to turn to Jesus. You, 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 this is the message for you. God sent his only son into the world for you. If you're someone who's been hurt and wounded and you've just, you're not where you used to be and you know it, I want to encourage you not to settle. Don't get comfortable. God's not done with you. The kingdom of God needs you. The kingdom of God needs you. His church needs you. God loves you and God cares about you and God wants to use you. Some of you walked away. I want to encourage you to come back. Some of you feel like you're you're just far from God. I want you to know it's not too late. Can you take one step? Maybe that challenge is just, I'm going to go to church throughout the month of January. We're in this brand new series called Impossible. We're going to be looking at impossible situations in the Bible. Maybe that's it. You're just going to come to church every week. What what a time. I mean, I don't know about you. Uh, 2022 was better than 2020, (laughs) but I'm looking forward to 2023. Anybody with me? I'm just looking forward to 2023. What a great way to start the new year. You start it with God. Start it with God because God sees your future and you don't know your future. And our life is a gift. Breath is a gift. The strength in your body is a gift. The blood flowing through your body is a gift. It's all a gift from the Lord. And God sees you. God loves you. God knows you. And you can know Jesus Christ this Christmas. Let me pray with you. Um, If you're ready to receive Jesus, would you just say this prayer? Say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to be my Savior. Forgive me for my sins. And I turn to you with all of my heart. Have your way. Others of you, maybe you need to say this, God, I, I just need a miracle. I'm in, I'm in the middle of the impossible right now, God, but I recognize you show up at the impossible. So I pray, God, that you move in a powerful way. Meet me in my desert. Meet me while I'm old and barren. Meet me in my cir- circumstances right now, God. I need you, Lord. Others of you might need to say this, God, right now, I'm going to choose to become your bondservant. I'm going to wrap myself around you and I'm just going to walk with you. I don't need to know everything. My plans, God, they're flexible because I want your plan and whatever you want, God. So turn to Jesus right now while you have breath in your lungs. Don't wait. Don't wait. Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I turn to you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your presence. It's enough. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.